We are October 7th, 2014, third meeting with David Sakharov, Makarov, Makarov. Uh, at your house in Nayot, in Jerusalem. Yesterday, we left off, um, you were telling me the story about the vase. The what? The vase. The vase, yes. The family, the, family. The, go the gold. The Solomon family, yes. The Solomon family. We talked about yes. the Solomon family. Yes. And what I really want to try and do today, because you're leaving tomorrow for a few days, I would like to try today to get from where we are right now to when you leave for Israel. All right. 1946, okay. is that correct? Oh, yes, fine. Yes. So I want you to tell me about the end of the war, where mm -hmm. you are. You're in, you're in Cal Calcutta. Mm -hmm. Um. You explained to me about the Habonim group that you met there and that you worked with there. I've, talk, I've talked about that. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I'm just reminding you, or yeah. reminding you a little yeah. of where we are chronologically. Mm -hmm. uh, I could assume it's probably it's late in the war. It's probably 1944. Uh, do you? Is there anything significant that happened to you uh, at the end of the war? Um, well, let me tell you one thing that happened while I was. Uh, in Calcutta. Actually, as I mentioned, I was in Barrackpore, which is 18 miles outside of Calcutta. And one day in the code room, I thought everybody was so, seemed so far away from me, and I realized I didn't hear well. So I went on sick call the next morning, and the captain, who was a doctor, looked into my right ear, looked into my left ear, and said, you have a cold in the head. I said, sir, I haven't been coughing, I haven't been sneezing. He cut me off. He said, soldier, you have a cold in the head. I said, yes, sir. I went back to my barrack. And three weeks later, I was still having that problem. I went to the sick call again. There was another doctor there. He looked at my left ear. He looked at my right ear. He said, you have a cold in the head. A cold I, in the head? Yeah. I what said, is that? A cold in the head, so you can't hear very well. Okay. So uh, I went back uh, to a sick call. There was a, a, second, there was a second doctor. He looked in my right ear and he looked at my left ear and he said, you have a cold in the head. I said, sir, I was here three weeks ago and they said I had a cold in the head. I haven't coughed, I haven't sneezed, I don't have a cold in the head. He said, soldier, you have a cold in the head. I said, yes, sir. Went back to my barracks. <coughs> three weeks later, I went back on sick call because I still couldn't hear well. And is it the, getting worse and worse, or? No, it was the same. The, and the first captain was there, the one, the first one that was there. And uh, he looked in my left ear, he looked in my right ear, and he said, you have a cold in the head. I said, sir, I was here six weeks ago, and you told me I had a cold in the head. Three weeks ago, another doctor said I had a cold in the head. Now you're telling me I have a cold in the head. I haven't coughed, I haven't sneezed, I have no fever. I don't have a cold in the head. He's looked at me in disdain. He said, well, I know what you want. You want a referral to the general hospital in Calcutta so you can have some time in the big city. I didn't tell him I was in the big city almost every day. So he said, well, I can't get you an appointment for six weeks. I said, doctor, I'm in the army. I'm not going anywhere. Would you make the appointment? So he made the appointment six weeks hence. I woke up with a terrible cold in the head. I didn't even go to the Make no sense to you? <clears throat> he told me three times I had a cold and I didn't have. When I finally got the appointment to go to the hospital, I woke up with a cold in the head. How did time. you know that you had a cold in the head? I was sniffing and coughing and uh, sneezing. So and very I, psychological. I, I, didn't, I didn't even go to the hospital because I knew he was safe. And did, you ever, did that hearing problem go away? No, no. When we were discharged from the American Army, we were 200 miles from Atlanta in Augusta, Georgia, and the sergeant said to the whole group of us who were getting ready to leave, if anybody has a physical disability of any kind, now is the time to talk about it so it'll be on your record. But I warn you, if you say you have a physical disability, our doctors are terribly overworked, you'll be here another six weeks to three months. We were 200 miles from home. Who wanted to be in Augusta for that? I don't know how many people who limped out of there without saying they had a disability. But I raised my hand and he said, didn't you hear me? 
I said, no, I don't hear you because I don't hear well. That's my problem. So he said, you'll be here for th three months. I said, I'll be here for three months. He was lying. He was just trying to get out of work. The next morning, uh, I, they put on my record, claims doesn't hear well, and I got out of the army. And later, when I was getting ready to go, go to Israel, I went to the VA in New York. They gave me a thorough examination. They said, you had auto, oh, I've forgotten the name of it right now, and uh, gave me a hearing aid and a stipend. But if I hadn't been stubborn with that sergeant, I would have walked out and had nothing. So you have to know your way in the Army. <clears throat> so. Where are you when you're, where are you at the end of the war? Uh, I had come back from Mishinaw. He'd been transferred to Calcutta, had a wonderful time in Calcutta, and uh, I had some leave time coming. So, uh, oh, by the way, I was in Barrackpore when we heard that Roosevelt died, and I want to tell you that even hardened soldiers cried when they heard that Roosevelt had died. And there was nothing we could do about it, because we just had the news. So when I had my leave coming, I decided to go to a place called Nanital, which is a summer resort in the Himalayan mountains on China Peak. And I went to Nanital for my leave, and I found the place was deserted. It was an army. It was a war. Nobody was going on summer leave. The setup was one large building, which was the dining room, the meeting hall, and so on, and then small cottages all around for the people who lived there. So I had a small cottage all to myself, almost nobody else in the camp. And uh, every time I would go into the dining room in the morning or the evening, I'd be the only person there. I came in one morning, and there were two British colonels sitting in one corner of the dining room. I walked over and sat in the other corner of the dining room. I finished my breakfast, and then I sensed somebody near me. I looked up, and the two British colonels were standing at my table, and one of them said, Sergeant, may we speak to you? Well, I'm kind. I said, sure. I just said, sit down. I said, sure, Colonel, what can I do for you? We have heard that the Americans have dropped a new kind of bomb on Japan. And since you're an American soldier, we thought maybe you would know something about it. Do you know anything about it? And I ran back and gave him my prognostication. I said, Colonel, you know as well as I do that every time a new weapon is invented, a new defense is invented. This war isn't going to end till we pry the last Japanese soldier out of his hole in Japan. Three days later, the war ended. And I knew the war ended because I got a telegram from one of the members of the Zionist group who had wanted to become a chalutz, but he was quite wealthy, and he had taken a job in a factory to be able to uh, prepare himself for Israel. But when the war ended, he sent me a cable which said, the war has ended and the stock market has fallen. That was his, that was his stick, the, the stock market. So uh, the war was ended, and it was a very ambiguous time. We, was the army discipline still enforced? Did you still have to do what the officer said? Did you still have to stay in the barracks and so on? No, nobody was quite clear what to do. But uh, war was ended, I knew I was coming home, so I started saying goodbye to all my Indian friends and to my surprise, they gave me a big farewell dinner in a hotel in Calcutta. Who, who's this? Who, the Jewish community there? The Jewish community, uh, including the Solomon family, who had been so lovely to me. And uh, they gave me a big dinner. Everybody said farewell. They gave me a uh, pair of gold cufflinks with my initials on it wow. as a gift from the community. And I went back to the barracks, and I found that we were not shipping out for another three days. We were just going to another camp closer to Calcutta. And I was in a bind. They had a big farewell. Everybody talked to me. Some people cried. And 
I was leaving them. How can I, they find me still walking around Calcutta after that? So I sort of hung out in my uh, barracks. You, you, kept, you laid low. Yeah. Once somebody saw me, and he couldn't believe that it was me. He stared, and I turned around and went the other way. So I don't know whether he still believes that he saw me. Why do you think, hold on a second. I just want to turn, how do I turn this yeah. light on? Sure. The one back here? Yeah, over there. Switch, Where? over there. Over there, okay. Just keep that on. Okay. <coughs> so what were you asking? That light? Yeah, that's much better. You were asking me something. Why, and this is what we're going to kind of end with the war, part of the war, but this Jewish community in Calcutta, I mean, you really kind of found a home away from home. That's right. Yeah. Especially with the Chalutz group. With, especially with the Chalutz group. Yeah. Did they ever come to Israel? Oh, yes. Several of them came to and Israel. And did you ever meet them back in Israel? Yes. Okay, we'll get to that when we get I've to that. Met, I've, I've met some of them in Israel. And was that a good feeling for you? Oh, of course. Of course. Uh, I once tried to hold a reunion of all the Calcutta uh, Chalutz group, and I began to get acceptances from everybody from the Calcutta Jewish community. I couldn't handle it. Uh, so many people, I had to give the, give the thing up. I couldn't do it. Uh, but I've met them, and uh, some of them I still am in touch with. Nice. So the war, the war is over. The war is over. We get, on, we get on a troop ship. We go back to the States. Uh, the greeting that we got in New York in New York Harbor upset me. Upset you? It was full of little rowboats, people who went out to meet the ship. On the dock there were throngs of, of mostly young girls who were for their boyfriends. And it was a fashion that season to wear purple. Everybody was wearing purple. All the girls had purple suits. They had purple umbrellas. Uh, and they cheered and they shouted, and I was uh, upset. Why? This is the kind of a greeting you give a returning football team, not the kind of a greeting you get soldiers who've been abroad for two years. And, uh, uh, and uh, they even had little boats that said, uh, "So and so, uh, hello." How they knew he'd be on that boat, I don't, I don't know. But anyway, uh, from there. We went to a camp, Camp Kilmer, New Jersey. And in Camp Kilmer, I, call, I wanted to call my sister, who was now living in New York. Everybody wanted to call home. Everybody wanted to get out. So I went to my officer, who was almost asleep in bed, and I told him that my sister was leaving the next morning for a year in Europe. And I very much wanted to see her. He said, no chance, when I went to sleep. So I got in line for the telephone. I finally, finally, at about four in the morning, managed to get her on the line. And she told me that she was working for the joint. And she, she was working for the joint. And they were sending her to Europe to work with the uh, refugees. Uh, She, so I, I didn't see her, I just spoke to her. When I got out of the army, she was already gone. Later, she wrote me that the joint had flown her to Paris. And from Paris, she had driven a jeep from Paris to Vienna. And she said, with a pistol in my lap the whole time, because it was dangerous then. And then the thing that tickled me was she added a PS, don't tell mama. Uh, wow, so your sister was also very active in the uh, yeah, movement. Yeah, so uh, I got discharged at that point, and I came back to Atlanta, Georgia. Okay, that's, this is a whole new chapter, and we're going yeah. to open up this chapter. All right. The war is over. <clears throat> you know, and the rest of the world knows what happened in Europe. Yeah. The concentration camps, the extermination of the Jews. We also know what's going on in Palestine with the British, but David is just discharged from the army. 
You were in the army for two and a half years? Three years. Three years. Two of them, two of them abroad. Two of them abroad. And you returned to Atlanta, Georgia after not seeing your mom for three years? Three years. It's a long time. How was your reunion with your mother? <laughs> what would you expect? <laughs> it was a joyous reunion. We had uh, written to each other while I was in India, of course. The mail took six weeks to be delivered from India to Atlanta. And it was very upsetting because I would get a letter from her saying, Uncle Harry's in the hospital. And it took the letter six weeks to get to me. I would answer her, why is Uncle Harry in the hospital? My letter would get back to her six weeks later. This is already three months since Uncle Harry was in the hospital. And the next letter I got from her said, who said Uncle Harry was in the hospital? I didn't even know he was in the hospital because that was the communication business. So it was a great reunion, of course. This time we lived on 6th Street in Atlanta and uh, I came home with my duffel bag and my helmet in Atlanta, and uh, that was the, the re-entry, and all the other guys were coming back, and we were saying hello and so on. So what, what's the plan? Well, when I got back to Atlanta, I found all the girls that I had wanted to marry were already married, and all the girls wanted to marry me I couldn't find one. So I decided I would move to New York where I'd been offered a job with Masada, the Young Men's Zionist Organization, to organize Masada chapters all over the South. And by using my Young Judean connections, getting in touch with people who had been in Young Judea, I began to organize Masada chapters. I order, organized about 15 chapters. What's and, a chapter? Uh, 15 groups, groups in each city. Uh, and, so uh, why, do you, why do you, wait a minute, why do you want to leave Atlanta? Because of what was going on in Europe, because of Hitler, because of the, uh, the refugees, because of uh, the wonderful things I was hearing about Palestine. What were you hearing about Palestine and from who? I heard about something which history has almost overlooked. The 300,000 Jews in Palestine established an automatic, an autonomous state without any way of enforcing their laws. They elected a cabinet with political parties. They established hospitals and schools, labor unions. They even had an army called the Haganah. But they had no policemen and no judges and no jails. This was the Ottoman Empire. The British? No, the, this was during the time of the Ottoman Empire, it was the Ottoman Empire. And uh, they established all this on a cooperative basis. If you didn't pay the taxes, there was nothing they could do to you. There were no police, there were no jails, nothing they could do. And on that, it was a voluntary state. And they established a real active state, which when the British came was of course the basis for what later became the state of Israel. But uh, it was a remarkable phenomenon. Here are people, the Ottoman Empire, and the Ottoman Empire did nothing for people except collect taxes. And they formed themselves into groups, Kibbutzim and Moshavim and city people, and established all the appurtenances of a government without any ability to enforce anything they decided, and people obeyed them. The Haganah, the civil servants, the... But what I, well, my question is, you're, you get back from the, from the war, you get back to Atlanta, you, you see your mother, you see your family, your sisters in Europe helping the, out the, the misplaced refugees, what do you want to do? Like, why, like... I wanted to go to Palestine, join this community I'd been hearing about and speaking about, and... But uh, what's wrong with Atlanta? Like, why do you want to leave? Because that wasn't where I could do, do anything about it. I uh, went to New York, and I went to work for Masada as an organizer in New York. Okay. Where, where, where are you working and where are you living in New York? 
We were working on 4th Avenue, the lower 4th Avenue yeah. in New York, was the office of Masada. Uh, and that's probably the, the, the headquarters of it in America. Yeah, right. yeah. And uh, I wrote material for Masada, I traveled for them and so on. And uh, one day... Were they happy to have you back after the war? Of course. I, uh, I was organizing chapters all over for them. And uh, one day, I don't know whether I should use real names or not, but I will. Keith Skadel, who later became a member of Kfar Bloom, who worked for the Jewish Agency, came to me and said, would you be willing to take a course to, plan, to train partisans behind the enemy line if it comes to that in Palestine? What would only red-blooded veteran of the American army side? I said, sure. I took the course. The course had been set up by Yaakov Dostrovsky, who was the chief of staff of the Israeli uh, armed forces. And he had asked for a course to be set up to train people to do this kind of thing. We met three nights a week for... Uh, and at the same time, you're, you're still working for Masada? Yeah, in the daytime, yeah. So does Masada know that you're doing this course? Big pardon? Does Masada know that you're doing this partisan course? Uh, I really don't know. It was a secret course, okay, but I don't, it wasn't really secret from our friends. Right, but who, who approached you again? Keith Skidell, Akiva Skidell. Akiva. From Far Bloom. And he was, he was a, a Sabra he, or American? He was an American who had come on Aliyah, who was wanted to come on Aliyah. He was working for the Sukhnut, and he knew what was going on. So he asked me if I would join this course. Did he we just were, approach you? He approached, yes. We were, we were friends. We had, okay. we had met. And uh, we were six people in the group, maybe eight. I think it was six. We met three nights a week for two months in the Young Israel headquarter on 12th Street in New York. These were people who were picked, who had already decided they wanted to go on Aliyah. The course, they made it clear, the course, they would not help us get on Aliyah. That wasn't the purpose. The purpose was for people who would be in Israel and would be able to undertake these tasks. We were trained by a group of people who were veterans of the OSS, which was the predecessor of the CIA. These were all instructors from the OSS. We never knew their real names. They used fake names. And they instructed us in things like weaponry, first aid, map reading, navigation, and something called police methods, which means entering a place without leaving a trace, and knowing if somebody else has been there before you and try not to leave a trace, how to, how to trail suspects uh, so along like, the street. So you're like James Bond. Like, but, well, it was, it was a, and uh, among other things, we taught codes and ciphers. And uh, over the course of the time, and by the way, of course, I was able to tell Frida what I was doing. They we're told, gonna, we're going to get to Frida soon because well, we're going to talk they told, about her. They told me at the, at the beginning that you cannot tell anybody about this course except your spouse. Because a man who's out three nights a week for three months and doesn't have his wife, he's not going to have a wife anymore. <laughs> so uh, I was free to do what I, what I was doing. And uh, Where did you meet Frida? The 12th, 12th Street, the Young Israel Headquarters, upstairs on the upstairs floor, the Young Israel Headquarters. Tell and me about it. Well, I can tell you that one night a bunch of us were going up in the elevator and uh, one of our instructors was in the elevator with us. And the elevator operator, who was an old Irish man, usually half drunk, said, what are you guys doing all the time going up at night to the, to the 12th floor? We didn't know what the hell to say. But the instructor, the OSS veteran, Smooth as silk, he says. We're taking a course to be cemetery caretakers. Cemetery caretakers. Who would gossip about a course taking a 
who would pass around new rumors in the bar about these guys that are taking the course? To be, say, somebody has to be a cemetery caretaker, caretaker, and then I guess it takes some training. But that was his that was his out for us that we were taking the course to be cemetery caretakers. So the purpose of this course that you're taking, you're six people in this course. Everybody's making aliyah soon. What is this base? Is this basically a turning point in your life? This course, as far as your direction. I think so. I Can think you explain so. to yeah. me why? <clears throat> because of it. I was learning things I never learned before, and I was putting into practice what I'd always wanted to do, to help Israel, to help refugees, uh, and I was doing it. Uh, one couple who were in the course never came to Israel. One man who was in the course, and I, we became very friendly, he was killed leading the attack on Mount Zion in Jerusalem. Uh, so there weren't, uh, one went to a kibbutz and stayed in the kibbutz, and one girl got married somewhere. But they all came, they all came to Israel. Uh, tell, t okay. Yeah. I'd like you to tell me a little bit about Frida, because you met her in New York, is that correct? No. I met Frida at an institution called Brandeis Camp Institute, which was a camp in Hancock, New York, sponsored by Hadassah to make young Zionists out of young college students. It was for a college age group and uh, they, they, they were representatives of all the groups there and Masada had to be represented there too. So I went as a representative of Masada and I was on the staff of Brandeis Camp Institute. This is of course after the war? Yeah. Yeah, this is when you moved, already moved to New York? Yeah. I was standing on the porch of the camp, welcoming, the, and this was a few days before the camp started. The staff were to come in for orientation session. So I was welcoming the members of the, orienta of the, uh, the staff, showing them where, the, where they were living, giving them information about the camp, because I had to come a few days even earlier than them to get oriented. And everybody showed up, all the staff showed up, except the nurse. And it was late in the evening, and I was waiting in the main building for the nurse. Finally, a taxi came up from the nearby town, and I realized that must be the nurse in the taxi. So I reached over to open the car door for her, and I heard her say, no, thank you, I can manage. So I stepped back, and she opened the door herself. She went around to the back of the car to get her luggage, and I went with her, and I opened the back of the car. She was loaded. She had tennis rackets and radios and books and uh, everything that she would need for the summer uh, in the camp. And I started to take them out of the trunk, and she said, no, thank you. I can manage. And she took the things out of the trunk herself. I said, do you want me to show you where the infirmary is? She looked at the big, big well-lit map on the wall, located the infirmary, located which she said, I can find it. No, thank you, I can find it. She loaded herself with all of that luggage, both arms and on her head. I wanted to hold, carry something for her. She said, no, thank you, I can manage. I said, well, can I take you down to the dispensary? She said, yes but don't you try to come in. So I went down, opened the door for her, and I went back to my bunk, which I shared with an Israeli shaliach, uh, Gershon Fradkin, and I told Gershon what had happened. And he said, these I must see for myself. And he went to see Frida, and he came back into the bunk, and he said, this is one big, fat, good-for-nothing nurse. But she wasn't big. She wasn't fat, she was a damn good nurse. And uh, after three months being together in Brandeis Camp, we decided to get married. 
Her mother came to camp to meet me, and when her daughter introduced me to her mother, she said, Ma, he wants to marry me and take me to Palestine. Her mother was supposed to say, over my dead body. She said, well, a wife goes where her husband goes. And that was one barrier down to our marriage. <clears throat> I uh, didn't last the whole season at Brandeis Camp because the, the director of the camp, Shlomo Bardeen, and I had different ideas. I knew about the, the <coughs> about the refugees. I knew about the need for the, to rescue them. I knew that ships were sailing and needed sailors to be on those ships. And uh, here were all these college guys that were looking, many of them looking for adventure that I could recruit for those ships. Who are you recruiting for, though? Are you recruiting? The Haganah. Are you recruiting? Are you a member of the Haganah? No, I was r recruiting for the, uh, because I knew the need. They, they would go to the Sakhmut for once, but I, I, didn't, I didn't manage to recruit them, so the question has moved. I, uh, when Bardeen heard that I was talking Aliyah, he went into a frenzy. His camp was completely financed by Hadassah. And he knew that if Hadassah women heard that their children were being told to leave the country and go to Palestine, they would cut off the funding immediately. So he declared it was a purely educational organization. And I decided, we got to get some of those guys onto the ships. The uh, climax came one night when he had a big giver there who spoke to a big giver, who spoke to the a donor, who donated money to the camp. He spoke to the, the donor spoke to us about the need for us to go home and raise money for Palestine. I couldn't control myself. He said they needed money to buy the ships for the refugees. And I got up and I said, who's going to man those ships? The scarecrows out of the concentration camps are young American college students. Bardeen called me in the next morning, and he said, we at this camp are an orchestra. Each of us plays our instrument. You play your instrument very well, but you are not in tune with the rest of the orchestra. And he fired me. <laughs> so uh, I went back to New York and waited for Frieda to finish the summer there. Hold on a sec. <coughs> um, when I left uh, Brandeis Camp, I was still working for Masada, and during my days of working there, I found out that we were organizing a Chalutz group of uh, members of Masada and members of Junior Hadassah. This was the only general Zionist Chalutz group that ever existed. All of the rest were labor Zionists and religious Zionists and so on. So we were a group called Plugat Aliyah, and our goal was to go on Aliyah uh, to Israel. While I was part of that group and working for Masada, it was again Akiva Skadel from Kfar Bloom who came to me and said, would you be willing to be the administrative assistant of the man who is in charge of illegal immigration uh, in New York? His assistant got married and he needs a new one. Of course, I jumped at it. Of course, that's what I wanted to do. So I was introduced to Zev Shin from Ayelet Shacha, whose nickname was Danny. Everybody called him Danny Shin. Danny was the head of the ship buying, equipping, and manning operation uh, in New York. I might uh, divert myself a little bit, say that the money for all this got started when Ben Gurion came to New York. He met a very wealthy, financier in Boston who was receptive to the idea of Zionism, and he explained to him the need to buy the ships to save the Jews who were being liberated from the concentration camps. What year is this? Forty... End of 45, beginning of 46. 
and uh, <clears throat> he asked them. He asked him to call his friends and ask them to contribute, and to ask them to call their friends. Ask them to sort of a snowball effect. It was very successful fundraising, and the remarkable thing was, because of the secrecy with which Ali Abed was encompassed, in, in there were no banquets, no fundraising events, no speeches. People were told Jews need help, and they gave money. Uh, so Danny uh, headed the operation, and I. How was your first? Where was your first meeting with Danny? Uh, we live. We were at, at 15 Stone Street. We were the Montrose Shipping Company, and I was. Ken took me there, and I met Donnie, and uh, he spoke English, but with an accent and not too well. I spoke almost no Hebrew, which was a detriment. But he needed somebody. I had bookkeeping training, office training. And that's what he needed. <clears throat> so. Uh, so basically. I, this is the guy with the cash. This is the guy who's in charge of the whole operation, yes. This guy is in charge of buying all the boats. Buying the ships, outfitting the ships, finding the uh, staff for the ships. Uh, he was the head of the whole operation. Uh, Danny? Danny Shin, S-C-H-I-N-D. From Kibbutz? Ayelet Ashacha. How old is he at this time? Is he older oh, than he, he, oh, uh, To me, he seemed ancient, but he must have been in his 40s. Uh, by the way, there was a, a funny story told about him in later years that he was picked for the ship operation by mistake. That somebody from the Sokhdut went to the kibbutz and asked if they had anybody that knew anything about ships. They thought he said sheep, so they sent their shepherd. And Danny Shin was the shepherd of Ayelet <laughs> uh, so, so Of course, yeah. there's, of course, there's no truth to that story because the word sheep and ships in Hebrew are quite different uh, words. Um, and that, that was the story. <clears throat> I'm just trying to get everything under, understood here. Yeah. At this time, is there any political agenda? within the Zionist movement that is starting to boil in with you? Uh, re re revisionist, uh, Mapai, uh, are you more on this side? Are you more on that side? Are you more against this? Are you more affiliated with this? Who, who are you at this point? I knew, from my work in Masada, I knew people from all the movements. Excuse me, from, from working? All, from working for Masada. Yeah. I knew people for all the, from all the movements. Okay. Uh, however, Masada was sponsored, as I mentioned, by the ZOA in Hadassah. They had no affiliates in Israel. They were not Mapai as Habanim was, or uh, Hashomat Seir was with Mapam here. Uh, this was an unaffiliated, and they were really quite surprised that somebody from a general Zionist group was interested in kibbutz. Uh, in fact, years later, there was a story about some member of the ZOA who heard about the kibbutzim, and he said, well, why don't we help our kibbutz in Israel? They told him, we don't have any kibbutzim in Israel. He couldn't understand why the ZOA had no kibbutzim. They were a capitalist, middle-class uh, group. So you asked me about the... Uh, the uh, as I worked for Danny Shin, Part of my work was laundering money. I would get money from one place, take it to a bank, put it in the bank, take it out, put it in another bank, buy stock with it, sell the stock, put the money in a third bank. I was laundering the money so that it couldn't be... Uh, you're doing exactly what your bosses did in Atlanta. Yeah. Well, you're doing it for a purpose. Well, of course. Yeah. And... Uh, it's interesting. Yeah, you well, I, those, I, was, I was laundering money. He was stealing money. <laughs> uh, that was part of the job. The other part of the job was to go up and see consuls from Central American countries. In New York City? Yeah. And I would ask for Mr. Lopez. 
their name was always Lopez. Mr. Lopez would come out and I would say, Mr. Lopez, I have an envelope for you. Do you have an envelope for me? And he would say, well, give me your envelope and I'll give you mine. I said, no, Mr. Lopez, you give me your envelope. You. So he would give me an envelope which had the flag papers <clears throat> on one of the ships we were sending. And I would give him an envelope that had $1,000 or something in it. We were bribing the consuls, mostly from Central America, to get the flag papers for our ships. What is a flag? For somebody who doesn't know what flag papers are, can you explain to me? The uh, papers that uh, make a ship legal, that decide uh, uh, who it belongs to, what flag it can fly, uh, what, it, what route it can follow. So most of the ships that you guys bought were South American? No, ships were not. The consuls were. And I bribed consul generals of South America to give us the flag papers for countries. ships that we bought anywhere we could find them. So you would buy a ship in New Haven or something like that? You're buying ships in Europe and Turkey and in New York or anywhere we could find uh, ships we were buying. So that was part of my, uh, my job was to uh, bribe the consuls. Why did we bribe the consuls? Because then they would not be able to publicize the fact that they had given us flag papers from their country. It would be surreptitious. And we knew the British were trying their best to get a hold on where our ships were and where they were going. So this is the way we kept the British from being able to, we bought the ships more or less illegally by bribing the consuls. And when the British tried to find out who owned the ships, these consuls wouldn't talk because if they talked, they'd find out they'd been bribed. Uh, am I making it clear? Kind of, I'm still a little confused, but it seems like it's a little bit of a well, the flag, let's say, let me just put, the flag papers on the ship are the legit, lit, 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 legitimation that they can sail. A ship without a flag for a sail cannot sail. It has to fly the flag and have the papers to prove that it's owned by that country and abides, obeys the laws and so on. So we were buying uh, the, the flags. And, uh, like Ecuador, Argentina. So most of, most of it from the south, Guatemala, uh, uh, the the other uh, Costa Rica, the other uh, Honduras. Those were the, the flags that we were using on our ships. Uh, <clears throat> so that would make it harder for the British to detect them. Of course. Not only that, we were very concerned about the British Secret Service. They were the best in the world at that time and they were determined to stop these ships from going. Were they operating in New York City as well? They operated wherever they had to. And therefore, we changed our office location once a month. And we changed the name of the company once a month. We were the Montrose Shipping Company on State Street. We were the, Amer the American Chinese Shipping Company on Broad Street. We were the uh, some other company on, on Wall Street. As we moved our office around, we changed the name to stay ahead of the British. It's a very secret operation. And uh, one of the things that happened to me was when Frieda and I decided to get married and her mother wanted to know what does he do, she couldn't mention illegal immigration. The word illegal would send her mother My up the wall. My fiance launders money and he bribes consuls. No, I don't think she could say that to her mother. Illegal immigration, the word illegal would send her up the wall. Uh, she didn't know quite how to tell her mother what, but at that point our office was on Wall Street. So she said to her mother, he's on Wall Street. That was it. There was never another question about what I did or why I did. She's a bright, he did she's, a bright story. she's a bright girl, Frida. Uh, so uh, this is what I was doing. And uh, as we bought the ships, we had a old Polish sea captain. His name was Captain Ash, who was a member of the captain's mates, marinas union in the United States. And he would climb all over the ships we were buying 
to tell us what repairs needed to be made, what shape the ship was in, and so on. He, uh, he was really a great help, and he would take no money. He hated the British, and he was... Uh, he was Polish? He was Polish. He hated the British, and he, he was sympathetic to the Jews. And did he know what you guys were doing with these boats? For sure. Of course he knew. Was he, was he, he, was he, he trusted? Had to, he had to you make guys the, trusted him? He had to make them, yeah. He had to make them seaworthy. Uh, at one point, on a, in a December, it must have been 45, uh, another guy and I were asked to go to Macy's and pick up a package for Captain Ash on Long Island. We went to Macy's, we got this enormous crate. We took it out to Captain Ash's house, we opened it up. It was one of the first TV sets. TV had just gotten started and he, we gave him, the screen was about two inches by four inches and you could barely make out what, he was delighted to get the, but he wouldn't take money, that's what we gave him the gift. Uh, now at the same time, that we were buying and outfitting the ships, there was a question of the, of the crews. How could they get men to work on the crews? So Keith Skidell set, set up at the Jewish Agency an organization called Land and Labor. And they recruited people under the guise that they were going to be agricultural workers in the kibbutzim. And that's the way they recruited ex-sailors, ex uh, nautical officers, and a lot of people who had had no experience at all who were willing to help out, and uh, that's how we manned the ships. Among other, other ships that we bought, there was a Chesapeake Bay tourist ship called the President Warfield. Now, there was no President Warfield in the United States, but that was the name of the company that owned, that owned the ship, President Warfield. We bought the President Warfield, and Captain Ash examined it, told us to go ahead and buy it. Uh, <clears throat> we got ready, we got the ship ready, and uh, at that time, Fried, I needed a vacation, so Fried and I got some time off. We went to Atlanta to visit my mother. While I was there, the day after I got there, I got a phone call from Danny. You must come back to um, New York immediately. Take the next plane back to New York. I said, Danny, why? What's happening? The President Warfield is sinking off of Cape Hatteras. You must come back to New York. I said, Danny, that's terrible, but what good would it do for me to come back to New York? There was a long pause, he said. If that ship goes down, Somebody has to notify the families of the, of the men. And I knew that somebody was me. I would be the one who would be notifying them of the death of this. So we took the next plane. Of the crew. Of the crew, yeah. We took the next plane back to, back to New York. And the President Warfield did not sink. I'm not, I'm not sure this is true, but I was told once that they put a cable underneath the hull and tightened it with a donkey engine and held the ship together until they got back to shore where it was repaired properly. Uh, then something else happened. We mentioned the revisionists a little bit uh, previously. The revisionists had a group called the Irgunsvi Lu'umi. It was called the Eitzel. They did not take their orders from the Jewish Agency or the Zion, World Zionist Organization. They were part of a rump organization called the Revisionist Zionist Organization. The Revisionist Organization rejected most of the platform of the Zionist Organization. They didn't want to buy land. They didn't want to live with the Arabs. They wanted to fight and con conquer the land. Uh, they, their emblem was a hand holding a rifle and underneath it the motto, only thus, only thus could they take the land. And there was, uh, well, I, in any case, a, an American playwright, Ben Hecht, was a well-known playwright, and he got interested in their operation 
and he put on a play on Broadway, which was a big musical play. Called? Which, uh, I, I don't remember. I, I don't know if it was called Israel Lives or something. I don't remember. But the play was a big success, made a lot of money. And with that, the Irgun bought a ship called the Abril, A-B-R-A-L. They renamed it the Ben Hecht. And uh, they were going to send it to Europe to pick up Jews. They had a big farewell party on the dock in Brooklyn. Newspapers, movie stars, big, big extravaganza as uh, Irgun was going to save the Jews. Because of their propaganda, all of our sources dried up. Nobody would sell us anything, not a blanket, not a barrel, not a, a piece of machinery, because they'd be, it, it was illegal, uh, and nobody wanted to be part of it. And it really cost us a, a lot of problem, because we had ships ready to sail, and we couldn't get flag papers. Even the, co even the consuls would no longer sell us flag papers. Am I, you with me? <clears throat> well, we bought the war field, yeah. and we needed flag papers so it could sail. <coughs> None of the consuls would agree, so the men I think I won't name it. The men who own the uh, uh, American, I forgot, the, it was, it was a, a company which brought fruit in from South, the, I'm sorry, I can't remember the name now. Okay. But it was a, the company which brought fruit in from all the Central American countries. And uh, Danny Shin got hold of him, and he explained the situation. And I'm told, Keith told me this, that he got on the phone and he called the president of Guatemala or Honduras or Costa Rico. Who called? The head of the, it was the United Fruit Company. Okay. The head of the United Fruit Company. He called <coughs> and he told the general in charge of that country for that while anyway, that the price of bananas was going to drop two cents a pound the next morning. The guy went crazy. Their country made millions of dollars on, on their banana stop. And dropping two cents a pound, they would lose a hell of a lot of money. And he would lose his cut, which he always got on this. And he, why? What did we do? What can we do? Why, why do you, why? Uh, uh, and, uh, it was explained to him by the head of the United Fruit Lines, we have a ship that we want to ship bananas in, and your consul in New York won't give us the papers. If without that ship we can't send the bananas, we'll have to drop the price of bananas. Next morning I went to see Mr. Lopez. Lopez. I didn't have an envelope. He did. He did. <clears throat> he, uh, gave me the, the ship papers and, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I, it's a, it wasn't quite like that. Uh, an American well-known Jewish financier was working with us, and when he heard we had the problem with the United Fruit Country, he, Danny Sheehan, uh, let me, the whole story, Danny Sheehan called me and said, I vote you should meet you should go to the mezzanine restaurant on 43rd Street between 5th and 6th Avenue. There you will find Dorothy Thompson and, uh, I, won't, I won't name his name now, sitting there, and they will tell you what to do. So I went to 46th Street, I went back and forth, couldn't find a mezzanine restaurant. I went to 45th Street, I went to 47th Street, I tried between 3rd and 4th. I wandered all over looking for the mezzanine restaurant. Finally, I called, decided I'd better call Danny and get better directions. So I walked into a restaurant, and there I see Dorothy Thompson sitting with the person. And I looked back at the sign of the restaurant, 
La Maisonnée. It's Danny's Hebrew accent in Israel speaking French that sent me to the mezzanine restaurant instead of La Maisonnée. So uh, when I got there, I was told, sit down, we have plenty of time. I sat and I found that the two of them were talking about whether Dorothy, you remember who Dorothy Thompson was? Dorothy Thompson was an American columnist who had a very, very famous column all over the, uh, spread all over the United States every night. And it was a weekly column and everybody couldn't, it was, she was like the Walter Winchell of the newspaper and people couldn't wait to read uh, her column. And what, she, was her, what were her columns about? Beg pardon? What were her columns about? All kinds of things. She okay. was a columnist and uh, she became a Zionist and so she was sitting there talking to the head of the uh, fruit lines and uh, after a while he said to me, I want you to send a telegram. So I took out a pad, a pencil, and he said uh, to, the, uh, to the president of United Fruit Lines, dear so-and-so, I am very sorry to be bothering you at this time of the night, but an emergency has come up which involves the lives of many Jews, and therefore I'm coming to, to New Orleans to meet with you first thing in the morning. Please put off any meetings that you have and make yourself available because this is a very important humane, humanistic act. <clears throat> well, I knew what a telegram was. Yeah. Telegram was 10 words. Once you spent more than 10 words, you were spending a fortune. So because of my code and cipher training and the course I'd taken, I was able to rearrange what he said. He said, read back what I said to you. I said, arriving, morning, please, rain, see me, important. He said, God damn it, that's not what I said. You write what I said. So he wrote a, almost a three-page letter explaining the situation to the head of the United Fruit Lines. And then when he did, he said, now, I want you to drive me to the airport. He, he, he's going to fly to New Orleans to see this. So who is this guy, the head of the United Fruit? Who, why, why is he important? Why is he even connected? Because he's Jewish? Uh, yes. And uh, he was Jewish and he was sympathetic. I mean, okay. He was also very worried about breaking the law, so it all had to be very secret. No, that's fine. I just don't yeah. need to know why yeah. that information. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Yeah. So continue. Yeah. No, so you drive him to the airport. Saving, saving Jews. That was all yeah, yeah, the yeah, 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 way yeah, answer. Sure, for sure. So I drove him to the airport. He, he said, now, you wait until my plane takes off before you send that telegram. And I realized what he was saying. Sure. He didn't want an answer to come back, can't see you, or too busy, don't bother me. He wanted to be on the way before they could stop him from coming. There. So I learned out how big, op I learned how big operators operate. Uh, a three-page telegram and, and arriving without chance to say no. And uh, so that's how we got the flag papers for the President Warfield. But <clears throat> when the Eitzel uh, started, had their party on the Brooklyn Dock, it blew everything apart because there's such publicity and so on. They bought a ship called the Abriel. They named it after the playwright Ben Hecht. They sent it off. It did reach the waters of Jerusalem. It carried exactly 405 refugees. We were bringing in thousands on all of our ships. But the money that they raised by their advertising and the way it closed down our operation, that the only way we were able to get the flag was by having the president of the United Fruit Lines blackmail the uh, Honduras uh, general. So the president, Wal the president Warfield saved, sailed. I told you I was called back to New York because it was sinking. It was saved and got back to the States. It sailed again, and on the way it changed its name to the Exodus 1947. Uh, so that was the story of the Exodus? That was what? That's the story of the Exodus boat yeah. and how it was purchased. Yeah, yeah. And 
uh, so you were involved directly with purchasing the Exodus. I wrote the check. You wrote the check. I don't remember how much it was. I wrote the check. You wrote the check and you delivered. I didn't it. sign it. Yeah, you delivered it. <laughs> I you delivered it. it. Yeah. Uh, and when that, when the Exodus became famous for what happened months and months later, how did that make you feel? How would you think it made me feel? I felt maybe it was for this that I was born. Anyway, it was well, after right. the exit. Yeah, I just want to, I want to take a little break. Mm -hmm. so. so once the President of Warfield had sailed and become the Exodus, uh, I, I, I decided that I could no longer sit in New York while all these guys were sailing the ships and fighting the, the British and so on. So Frida and I decided now the time had come to go on Aliyah. This was in 1947. <clears throat> uh, we had been married on 19, in 1945 in the fall. This is 1947. Where did you guys live when you first got married? In New York. Where? Uh, Do you remember? On 123rd Street near the Jewish Theological Seminary. Okay, near Columbia University. Yeah, yeah. Upper West Side. Yeah. Okay. And uh, you guys get married. Where do you get married? Well, Let's talk a little bit about your personal life. All right. When I uh, asked Frida to marry me, uh, the first time she told her mother I was on Wall Street. The second time, she asked me, almost the first time we met, knowing I was from Atlanta, she said, how do you feel about Negroes? I said, they're people like everybody else. That one, another barrier went down. Frida, yeah. asked you that, okay? Yeah, because I had come from Atlanta. Then, uh, let's see, where are we? Oh, uh, when we decided to get married, uh, I, I decided on Dr. David de Solo Pool. Excuse me? Dr. David de Solo Pool, who was a very well known Sephardic rabbi who had a big synagogue on, up on uh, Central Park West. So we went to see him about the marriage, and we talked, as we came in, Frida sat in an easy chair, he sat behind a desk, and the only other place to sit was a footstool. So I moved the footstool over and I sat on the footstool. So we talked about the details of the wedding, and when it was all over, he said, uh, I hope you realize the importance of this moment. I said, I'm getting married, I certainly agree. He says, no, you don't realize the importance of this moment. You are sitting at her foot, at her, at her foot, you're sitting at her feet. You will do, be doing that for the rest of your married life. Rita loved it. I never, I never appreciated it very much. Anyway, we were married by David DeSoto Poole, and uh, then we just- in what month? Was For, uh, December the 5th, 1946. December the 5th, 1946. 46. So you guys had gone out for about a year, roughly? Since the summertime, really, only since the summertime of 46, yeah. And, and did you know that she was the one? It grew on me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <clears throat> anyway, uh, I want, I want, I want, before we talk about the Aliyah part, I want to go back a little bit more. Sure. I want to understand what's happening, because in all these interviews that we've done with this whole project, Togot Yisrael, there's barely any information about what was going on in New York City as far as Aliyah bet and the hustling and bustling and the bribing of councils and, and, it's not, we don't really have that. And here I have the opportunity to sit with you and talk about that. What was going on in New York City, in the States, in, behind the curtains? Oh, zero, the ZOA was organizing demonstrations against uh, Britain. Uh, there were dinners to raise money. Uh, every organization, every Zionist organization, most Jewish organizations were very supportive of the Zionist movement except one organization called the American Jewish Council, it was the American Council for Judaism. They were old-time German Jews who were well integrated in American society. 
And like the German Jews who saw the Russian immigration came, they were afraid the Zionist activities would cast suspicion on them that they were not loyal Americans. And they became an anti-Zionist organization. Tell me more about this organization. The American, the American the Council for Judaism. The American uh, Council for Judaism. Yeah. Uh, they had offices on Fourth, on Fourth Avenue. And they advertised and they uh, fought against uh, any, Im, anything that would impugn their American citizenship. How could you be for Israel, for a Jewish state, if you were an American? That sort of thing. Uh, we had no very personal uh, with them, but that was the fight that was going on in the community. The ZOA was much bigger, and uh, Hadassah. So they were anti-Zionists, anti or, they, or they were just? They were anti-Zionists. Did you ever encounter any of them? No. No. I've never heard of that. Well, you look it up sometime. The American Council for Judaism were the enemies of Zionism. So they were probably, tell me about your encounter with, in America, with the, with the Etzel, with, uh, with whom? With Beitar. Uh, because there was a big riff. And I, apparently you're more sided with Mapai. Well, Beitar was part of the revisionist sure. movement. Yeah. And it was the revisionist movement which opposed a Red Zionist organization. As I mentioned, they had their own philosophy about how to get the state. Uh, they raised money through that ship, the Abril. They raised a lot of money put our operation on ice for a while. Nobody wanted to talk to us, sell to us or anything. Uh, and I, uh, I really didn't know at that point anything about the youth movement guitar. I'd never heard about it. And Young Judea, Junior Hadassah, Masada. I heard there was a Jewish Zionist group, but uh, I never had, we never had much contact with them. And within the Jewish community in New York City in the mid-40s, while you were living in New York, so you were in New York altogether for about two years. Yeah. Actually, it was one year. I got married. And I, uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, you're working with, you're working with the Sukhnut. You're working for the Sukhnut. Um, you're buying ships, you're laundering money, you're bribing councils, you're getting married, you're starting your family. So we didn't, we didn't start a family. Well, yeah. you got married, which yeah, is the first step in yeah. starting a family. Yeah. New York, post-World War II. Big demonstrations for Zionism. Tell me about that. Well, I really wasn't part of them. I was... I understand, but... Uh, there were big demonstrations, uh, Rabbi Abba Hillel Silva and uh, uh, people that came from Israel and people came in. And there, was, there was a march for Israel in New York, uh, not Israel those days, but, and uh, I don't know what else I can tell you about that. That's, that's the way was it, it was. It, Everybody, was it an exciting time? For me, it was exciting, yeah, personally, because, saying, of yeah. what I, because of what I was doing. It was very exciting about buying the ships and, and so on. Uh, I really felt I was doing something important. Uh, and uh, when the Exodus 1947 was captured by the British, everybody was reading the newspapers every day as to what they were doing. And you probably remember what they did. <coughs> they forced them off the ships with arms. They boarded them onto another ship, and they started back to Germany, put them back in Germany. <coughs> that really shocked the world, that the Jews were having to go back to the concentration camps because of the British. Bye, phone. Right here, it's right here. I'll turn off the phone. 
So you probably you probably know that the British declaration that no more Jews could come to Palestine was called the White Paper, and uh, the motto that Ben Gurion adopted was uh, during World War II, we will fight the war as though there were no white paper. We will fight the white paper as though there were no war. And so this is part of the fighting the white paper that we were doing to allow more and more Jews to get in. The, the British kept a very tight control on how many Jews could get into Palestine. Now, <clears throat> you were in the Second World War in the American army. The British were your allies. Now you're out of the army, and the British are your enemies. How does that? Well, it wasn't the same written. It was Attlee, the prime minister, who was an anti-Semite and uh, against anything uh, uh, Israel. The, uh, our feelings about, uh, you know, we had never really, f well, we had. Our feelings about Britain changed because it now became a colonial power that wouldn't give up uh, its power. And uh, we, we fought. In any way that we could, the British. We were particularly concerned about the British Secret Service or Intelligence Service, and we did everything we can to avoid them or to uh, fool them. Did you have any encounters with the British Secret Service while you were operating in New York City? No. No. Were you ever arrested? Were you ever caught? Were you ever endangered? No, 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 no. Uh, there were people who were caught and charged. We kept our secret, our operators secret. We moved the office, we changed the name, and uh, one time we were buying ships. We bought five ships at one time. Two from Turkey, three from other countries. The Turkish ships were the Pan York and the Pan Crescent. And uh, whenever we bought ships, we always organized a new corporation to own the ship. So if the British caught a ship and found out who owned it, they wouldn't find what other ships we, we had sending. And uh, we bought five ships, and we needed five innocuous names for the corporations. Not Jewish, not connected with each other, not connected with Israel. And Keith Scadell told me he was present at the meeting. I wasn't. There was a meeting at the 17 Hotel, which was the headquarters in New York. And uh, in New York? there was a hotel called the 17 Hotel. <clears throat> that became the headquarters for uh, Ali Abed. It was owned by a couple who was sympathetic to Zionism. But the most important thing was it was upstairs from the Copacabana nightclub which meant people coming into and going out of the building nope, assumed they were going to the nightclub. So that was called the 17 Club. And uh, what was I saying about that? You had meetings there. Hmm? You would have meetings there at the hotel. No, the, the, the group that were oh, in with charge. The with, the, with the five ship yeah, names. Yeah, the, gr the group that was in charge of all of this. I was, a, I was a, an employee. I was a policymaker. Uh, they gathered one night and they were trying to find innocuous names for the five ships. They found, after much difficulty, four names they could agree on. They could not agree on the name. They couldn't even think of a name for the fifth ship. It was late. The room was full of cigar smoke. Everybody wanted to go home. Nobody was being very creative. They couldn't come up with a name for the Fifth Corporation until the lawyer of the group, whose name I won't mention, said, why don't we just call it the Fuck the British Shipping Corporation? When the British captured the Pan York, they found that it was owned by the FB Shipping Corporation. They never knew why. So they caught that ship. Huh? They caught that ship. Oh, they caught most of the ships. Very few really got through. But they found it was the FB Shipping Company, which they accepted they didn't like that. The F, they didn't yeah. know what the F stood for. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I was, that was what I was doing at, at that time. That, that's fascinating. That's fascinating. That is, 
um, what we call working from behind the scenes. Oh yeah. Now, when the Exodus got caught, that was the trigger. Like you guys, had, Frida didn't mind immigrating to Palestine. Didn't bother her. Her mother said, "Where her husband goes, the wife." I know, but Frida, we, Frida will tell you her story. She will tell you her story. Yeah. That's, that's absolutely true. Um, so when the Exodus gets caught, the ships you mean? The ship. When the yeah. ship gets caught by the British, yeah, you're in New York City. Yeah. What do you? What, oh, furious! What can we do about it? They took the caught the Exodus, bullied the people off the ship, put them on another ship, and sent them off on another ship, and the ship stopped in a, a, a port in, New, in France, I don't remember what, and the French government offered the refugees on the ship, refuge, refugee in France, they could stay in France and become French if they would get off the ship. Not one person took up the offer. Why? They wanted to go to Palestine. They were not interested in becoming Frenchmen. They were Jews going to Palestine. And when they finally gave up and took the ship to Germany, oh, that created a public furore. How could they do that? The people who had not been anti-British became anti-British at that, at that point. Uh, so... What did the, what did, what did, is that, was that like the, the trigger that made you decide I am making, I'm getting out of New York? No, I figured long ago um, when I joined Mossad and I found there was a group called Plugat Aliyah that was planning to serve, set up their own kibbutz in Israel. I joined Plugat Aliyah immediately. Where was that, in New York? In New York. We had about 30 members from all tell, over the tell country. Tell me a little bit about that group. It was a group made up of Masada and Junior Hadassah members. Uh, uh, co-ed group. It was called Plugat Aliyah. The goal was to go as a group to Israel and to establish a kibbutz in Israel. People came who we recruited through uh, Masada publications and others, and people came. I remember one guy came walking in with his leg in a cast. He had been injured in an uh, army accident. He lived in Florida. He came up to the, uh, to the Masada office cold. We didn't know him. He didn't know us. He said, uh, I want to go on the ships. And uh, that, that was one of the ways that but people came in from the youth movements. They came in from college, uh, idealistic kids. There was even a Christian preacher who came on the Exodus, named Sidney Growl, G-R-A-U-L. He made the trip because of his sympathy toward the Jews in Israel, and he later made his, his living by lecturing all over the country about what happened to the Exodus. And he was on the Exodus? Yeah. Did you know him? I had met him once, that's yeah. all, <clears throat> seen him once. So, <clears throat> the Plugat Aliyah, uh, we had planned to come. Uh, we, had, we could not come as a group, we had to come individually. So Frieda and I decided to go on Aliyah. Not so easy. The British were not letting people in to... Uh, Even if you had an American passport? Not, not if you were Jewish. And uh, the uh, only way that we could get around the British restrictions on immigration was to become a GI student at the Hebrew University. The Hebrew University had been accredited by the British as accepting GI students. You know what the GI Bill was? Explain to me. Please. You know, the GI Bill was a, a bill which made higher education available to veterans according to the length that they had served. That was the length that they would get supported, tuition paid, and some monthly uh, payment. So uh, 
I applied to the Hebrew University to become a Hebrew University student. I still have in my files the letter in which they accepted me to the Hebrew University. So I figured a GI student going to the university, Britain is our lie, United States, no problem. <clears throat> there was a problem. <coughs> Anybody that wanted to go and stay in Israel had to prove that he could support himself, that he would not become a public charge. Either you had to have enough money or you had guarantees from someone. I didn't have enough money, and I didn't know anybody who lived in Palestine. But in Young Judea, in the south, I had met a woman in Chattanooga, and she told me once that her friend had moved to Palestine. So I wrote to her, and she wrote to her friend, and her friend wrote back to me, Dear Nephew David, we will be very pleased to take care of you, and da 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 and that letter uh, got, got us into Palestine. And did you ever see those people when you came here? She was a wife of the first mayor of Herzliya. The name is Shin Zion Levine. His children later changed their name to Nevo. Yosef Nevo and Avram Nevo and, uh, and I'll get to it later, but uh, Yosef Novaya became my commanding officer when I joined the Haganah. Uh, so when do you finally get all the paperwork all together? How long does it take you to get all that? Uh, well, with the uh, invitation from the Hebrew University and the letter from the uh, Hana, uh, I was able to, I don't remember, if I went to the British consular, I don't remember how I did it, but we got permission. So you actually moved to Israel legally? Yes. You and... We moved, to, Pal we moved to Palestine. You, yes. moved to, you moved to Palestine legally? Yes. Um, as a student with a wife. As a student with a wife. your wife, who's yes. a nurse. Yeah. She's got a profession, which is very yeah. important. Yeah. Your mother, do you say, go say goodbye to her before you leave? Of course, and she said what she always does. If that's what you want to do, do it. Where's your sister? Is she still in Europe at the time? Sister's in Vienna at the in time, working, working with the uh, refugees. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Were you in contact with her? Only by mail. By mail, yeah. But you guys kept in contact, of course. Yeah. That told you she wrote me that she drove from Paris to Vienna with a pistol in her lap, but I shouldn't tell Mama. That's amazing. So tell me. So we went on Aliyah in May of 1947. May? May 1947. May 1947. Hello, we, Frida. We were. Frida's on? Yeah. You have a pass to come in? Mm -hmm. You have a pass to come in? Do you want to have a, a slice of. Uh, I'm great. I had a huge, huge. Breakfast before I came. Okay, so we're going to be done soon? Yeah. Yeah. What time is it now? It You're is. not going to be done soon because I'm not done yet. Well, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna stop when we get to, to Palestine. All right. We're going to talk about the voyage. We'll right. be done soon. <clears throat> okay? Mm-hmm. We sailed. Wait. So you go, you say, you go down to Atlanta, you... Say goodbye. Say yeah. goodbye. How was that? Uh, my mother said, if that's what you want to do, do it. And, uh, I don't think she really meant it, but uh, that was the way she was. Both of her kids are gone. Well, my sister, that's all we had, yeah. Yeah, yeah. she's alone. Yeah, she's in, uh, she's in Vienna. Uh, so uh, we sailed on a ship called the Marine Corp, which was an unreconstructed army transport. It had not been made into a passenger ship. The boats were four high in the bowels of the ship. Uh, 30 in one room, 60 in another room. Uh, of course, the men and the women were divided, but there were no couple arrangements at all. The men were in one section, women in the other section. 
Uh, when we first got on the Marine Corp. You sell from Brooklyn? Uh, yeah. We have a picture of Frida's mother waving goodbye. Uh, we got on the Marine Corp and we found there was a long line of person, people standing at the purser's office, each one demanding to change their accommodation. And he was so used to it by now, he was automatically saying, no, nope, no, nope, can't do it, no changes, sorry, can't do it, next. I was the last one in line. And I came up to him and I said, I want to thank you for our accommodations. He said, no, nope, no, nope, can't. What'd you say? I said, I want to thank you for my accommodations on the ship. He said, you like your accommodations? I said, I'm crazy about it. But the 34 women in my compartment are not very happy about it. He grabbed his clipboard, he said, oh my God, he grabbed his clipboard, put me in a, another place with 60, uh, 60 men. So you were put in at the beginning with, with only women? Yeah, I don't know why. I, you know. <laughs> so uh, maybe I should have stayed, but <laughs> anyway, uh, the ship was, the trip was uneventful. We were all going to Palestine. Everybody and, on the boat was going to Palestine? Yeah, the boat, yeah. Uh, well, actually it was going past Palestine because that same person, Keith Skedell from Far Bloom, was on the ship with us going to Palestine. And he had a three-year-old daughter. Now, Keith had, did not have permission to go. He was going illegally uh, because he was so important in the Jewish agency and he'd done so much. And also, like me, he was tired of the office work. He wanted to get into the action. So, uh, what was his name again? Akiva? Akiva Skidell. S-K-I-D-E-L-L. -L. He's dead now. Uh, they had a three-year-old, I think a five-year-old girl, daughter on board at that time. And uh, since they had no permission to grant land in Palestine, the ship was going on to Greece from Palestine. They told the daughter to let anybody who asked her that they were going to Greece. So it got to be a game saying, Sara, where are you going? In Greece? I'll give you an apple if you tell me where you're really going. Oh, Palestine. And they, bribed, they all bribed them. So anyway, uh, they came. How, how could they get on a boat destined to Palestine if they don't have papers? Uh, which boat? Uh, the boat had papers. No, the boat had papers, but this guy Akiva, Skidel, from Far Bloom. It was our ship. It was, uh, we had taken over the ship. We didn't own it, but we had taken over the ship. He, he, I, I don't know what the paper situation. I don't even know if I had papers. No, you had papers. To, you you were. Could go but I don't to think I, I don't think I had to show them to anybody. I think he just had to buy a ticket. Okay. And uh, he was on the ship. There was also a group of junior Hadassah girls on the ship, making a. Year, uh, year of study program in Israel. And every day, they would get out on the back deck of the ship and practice their Palestinian dances, which they had learned from Palestinians in books and so on. They would dance these intricate dances. And on the ship, there happened to be a man named Yosef Baratz. Baratz was an original pioneer in the old days to Israel. He was one of the founders of Kibbutz de Ganya. He was on the ship going back to Palestine, and he watched these girls dancing their so-called Palestinian dances. And I heard him once mutter, Afpam lovriti devad kazeh. I've never seen anything like that. The Hadassah girls' palace, so-called Palestinian dances. Anyway, it was, the crossing was really uneventful, not very happy. And uh, we got to Haifa. Do you remember the date? I think it was May 15th. We might have left May 15th. I don't remember quite. Uh, and as we got off the ship, a friend of mine from Louisiana, Young Judea, had come to Israel before me. His name was Jerry Renov. He later became quite famous. But uh, Jerry had come before, and he knew we were coming. We were friends. So he met me inside the custom shed in Haifa. <clears throat> he said he came to help us through the procedure. Well, we had 13 pieces of luggage. We'd brought our 
kitchen stuff and our bedroom stuff. We were moving to Richmond, so we had 13 pieces. And uh, a young man, probably from a kibbutz, was the one that helped us move everything, did everything physically for us. And uh, when we got ready to go out of the big wide door in the customs hall, I had the papers in my hand that I'd been through the whole procedure and could get through. There was a British soldier on one side of the door and an Arab official on the other side of the door. And as we approached the door, I headed toward the British official to show him my papers. Jerry grabbed me by the shoulder. He said, don't you ever, ever admit their right to serve us, to, to rule us. They have no right to rule us and we're not going to. He took, he took my papers. He stuck it in his pocket, and he took another paper out of his other pocket. And as we went by the Arab guide, he waved the paper at me. I waved his own. When we got away from the ship, I said, Jerry, you took my papers. Why would you show the Arab guide? He took it out. He showed me. It was a laundry list from the hotel. He said, I knew he couldn't read. <laughs> you could probably bribe him, too. Yeah. So, so uh, this is this is May 1947. Yeah, you guys arrive in Israel. What are your first impressions before you get to the kibbutz? We're not we're, we're actually not going to get to the kibbutz today. We're going to get that's what we'll start with next time. But well, what are your impressions? You you get to Haifa. You're in the Holy well, Land. Let me let me just tell you one thing about uh, getting here. When we finished in the custom shed, there was a truck waiting for us from Kibbutz Ginigar where our Plugat Aliyah was settling. And uh, the young man who had helped us all through the customs shed there, and like a well-known New Yorker, I reached in my pocket to give him a tip. He saw what I was doing. He pulled himself up. He said, I do a day's work. I get a day's pay. I don't take tips. And I felt, boy, I've arrived. This is the kind of place. I wanted to, to live in. The, uh, the old Chalutzik song was, Banu Livnot Ulihibanot. We came to build and to be rebuilt. And uh, I felt that way. I didn't want to be an American bookkeeper anymore. I wanted to be an Israeli. And he was, my, he was my first introduction. No tips. I do my job. Uh, what were your expectations when you came? Uh, I expected that we would go right to the kibbutz, our group would form a kibbutz, and we would go out on the land and establish our own kibbutz. This is what we all intended to do. Incidentally, regarding the arriving in Israel and the repressions, it was at the same time, but sometime later an uncle came to see me, and he reported to me that he ate in a restaurant, and when he left, the waiter came running after him and said, you left some money on the table. He said, that was a tip. The waiter said, what's a tip? Those were the days. <laughs> uh, somebody from the Jewish agency met us, a woman who was a minna something, and she took us for our first meal. We had our first hummus and tahina and falafel in a restaurant uh, near, the, near the port. In Haifa. In Haifa. How was that? Yeah, wonderful. <laughs> and we spent the night in the something court hotel uh, in, Lower, in Lower Haifa before we went on to uh, Jerusalem. Jerusalem or Genigar? That's a Genigar. I'm sorry. Genigar, that's the kibbutz first. Yeah. 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 So the idea the is kibbutz, to go to the, the kibbutz. The kibbutz period is another thing altogether. Yeah, I'm we're sure going to get, gonna get to that next time. That's where we're going to stop right now. But. Um, we're gonna, next time that we meet, we're going to start with you guys arriving to Kibbutz Genigar, and then, of mm -hmm. course, we'll continue on. Then you left, and then you go to Jerusalem, and then the war breaks out, and then Kuftad in November, you're actually back on the Kibbutz for visiting, right? You came back to visit yeah, them. Yeah, you remember that. Right? Yeah, I read your book. <laughs> I, read, I read it. And, um, um, Why don't you just read my book out loud on that? <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything that we talked about today, um, anything... Uh, in the period of New York, of the, of the ships, of the, um, that maybe something that we forgot to talk about, something that you think is significant. Um, 
I'm gonna give you a little, a little time to think about that. Just try and think if there's something that maybe some detail that we passed. Or well, the freedom, uh, the whole relationship with freedom, and that's, uh, as you say, is another story. Uh, well, I will tell you. Okay. I was working for Danny Sheehan. We were working very hard with the ships. This is back in New York. Yeah. Right. When we got, uh, when Fried and I got married, I only had two days for a honeymoon. We went to the Barbers on Plaza Hotel for two days, and that was my honeymoon. Where was that? In New York. So you get in the city? Yeah. Barbers on Plaza it was downtown in New York. And Frida was so naive that she didn't want to be seen walking through the hotel lobby carrying a bouquet. Everybody would know she was just married. So she left it in the taxi. They left the bouquet in the taxi. We walked into the hotel uh, without it. Um, on our way, the next couple of days when we were on our way back to our apartment in the Upper, upper West Side, we went in a taxi. And all at once I see Frida crying. What are you crying about? She said, we've traveled six blocks and we haven't said a word. We're just not compatible. Uh, what else can I tell you? Oh, she learned that I like tuna fish. Say what? That I like tuna fish. I like tuna fish. I make a great tuna fish salad. I like it. I always have. So the first day I came home from work, she told me she had made me a tuna fish casserole. I don't want a casserole. I want tuna fish right out of the can like it comes. It's ready to eat as it is. So I made myself eat some of the casserole. She looked at me and she said, you don't like the casserole, do you? I said, Frida, next time you feel the need to cook a big meal or to bake a cake, sit down and read a good book. It's much, better, much more profitable for you. Were you good friends with, um, with, uh, with Danny? No. No. Purely bit, partly because I hardly knew Hebrew. Right. And he had a hard time expressing himself in English. But he, needed, but he needed you. Yeah. Keith Skidell was much closer because Keith spoke in, uh, Hebrew. Uh, so, uh, was his name Keith? Akiva. Akiva. He was called Keith, yeah. T-I-E-V-E. -E. And then and there's Ken. There was a guy named Ken also. Ken? K-E-N? I'm probably made up his name for, to hide some other name. I don't remember what <laughs> that was. Did, did, did that uh, period of secrecy affect, uh, have a big influence on you? Of keeping things? Yeah. I, uh, also later I, on? I had taken that course for the partisans and I had learned a lot about security. So. Uh, I, I knew about security. I knew to check if anybody was trailing me, uh, looking for dead, dead drops. And uh, yeah, it had a. And uh, I knew I was doing something important. I enjoyed doing it because I felt I was screwing the British. And uh, and what I was doing, all that was small stuff. I, the book, you know, is called A Small Cog. I was a small cog, but things wouldn't have turned, around, uh, turned over without me. So we are going to, we're going to stop for today. Uh, and we will continue when you come back from your cruise. Talking right. about cruises, getting on boats. <laughs> this is a, isn't the same thing. <laughs> I will not be in a cabin with 34 women. <laughs> <laughs>